Nick related to his three aides in the first place, his experiences of the night previous, when he had happened on the heels of the burglary. This he followed by a statement of the information that had been given him by Mr. Heron, and concluding said, This promises to be a most interesting case. I am impressed with the straightforwardness of Mr. Heron. Still, there may be another side of his statement or case, and he may not have been wholly frank with me. Though I am inclined to believe he was, I shall immediately set out on that point. Under Mr. Heron's statement, suspicion naturally turns to one of the parties anxious to obtain possession of that invention. And to the widow, said Ida. If not to the widow, said Nick, to someone representing her or standing as a representative of her. But we must not lose sight of the fact that, after all, this may have been the commonest kind of a burglary and that the burglars took the case they found in the house simply because it was in their way to do so and without the slightest knowledge of the value Mr. Heron and the others put upon it. To look after that end of it, that is, after those who actually did enter the house, must be Patsy's work. It is a difficult job, Patsy, and I hardly know how to give you a starting point. But if you'll go to the neighborhood of 35th Street and make careful inquiries, you may be able to find someone who saw something of those men in the carriage that will give you a starter. Patsy nodded, but seemed to be thinking of something else. Well, asked Nick, what is it, Patsy? You've got something on your mind. Out with it. It's this, Chief, replied Patsy. Say, didn't you say that his nibs, this heron, had a case made to hold those papers? Yes, replied Nick. Well, then, said Patsy, the thing is whether anybody, except Heron, knew of this case. You mean, said Nick, whether any of those who are opposing Mr. Heron knew that the models and papers were kept in a case especially made for them by Mr. Heron. That's what I mean, said Patsy. It's a very good point, said Nick. If they didn't know, and if the knowledge of such a case was confined to Mr. Heron, it would go far toward throwing a doubt on his suspicions. Yes, said Chick. It would raise a doubt. But after all, there is that search through all the drawers and desks that you say was so plain, and that made you think when you saw it that the thieves were looking for some one particular thing. That's just what I was thinking of, said Ida. If they were so strict in their search that they even looked behind pictures hanging on the walls, you may be sure that they didn't leave any trunks, satchels, dress suit cases, or any other kind of cases unsearched. And in doing that, might have hit upon the case and, opening it and seeing the model, found just what they were after. Nevertheless, said Nick, Patsy's point is a good one. And, working on that line, he is quite likely to hit up against something. And so, Patsy... You would do well to see Mr. Heron, find that out, and get from him the name of the person who made the case. And, perhaps, from that person you may find something of value. However, that is your line. Turning to Chick, he said, You take this list of promoters, Chick, and find out all you can about them, what sort of men they are, and what their associations are. To Ida, he said, I want you to get acquainted with the widow and find out what you can. It is even hard to suggest what it is you are to find out. But if you get her confidence, she may tell you some things as to those who have made her offers that will be valuable in this inquiry. As for myself, I shall go again to the 35th Street house to make a closer investigation, and I will take up the lawyer with whom Mr. Heron has consulted. Now let us scatter and meet later in the day to compare notes and determine upon a plan of action in the light of more knowledge than we have now. Nick Carter's first step was a visit to the house in 35th Street, where he found Mr. Heron awaiting him. Since my return, I have carefully figured the value of the articles taken from the house, he said to Nick. 
All of the jewelry left in the safe in my wife's room is missing. The value of that is about $5,000. All of the plate that was genuine silver has also been taken. The value of that does not exceed $2,500. Fortunately, Mrs. Heron had deposited in the safety deposit vaults the more valuable part of her jewelry some two weeks ago as not being required for some months to come. Thus, the loss is figured down to about $7,500, apart from the case, concerning which I am so anxious. Then, asked Nick, apart from that case, what was taken was from the safe in Mrs. Heron's room and from the dining room safe. That is all, replied Mr. Heron. Now, I want to say that, with that case out of my hands, there stands me in an actual loss about $33,000. My anxiety today is to secure the return of that case and its contents. In securing that, I secure what represents to me an outlay of $25,000. I am quite willing to sacrifice the other valuables in order to get that case back again. Indeed, I am willing to spend more money and, with this statement, I turn the matter over to you to do as you think best pledging myself to respond to any demand you may make upon me. There was a young man in the house last night with whom I talked, Temple by name. Yes, replied Mr. Heron, a nephew of mine, the son of a sister, who, though not living with us, is nevertheless very intimate in the house. He slept here during the absence of the family at my request. What are his habits? Excellent. He does not dissipate? No, not in any direction. If he is under any criticism as to his course of life, it is that he is too much devoted to athletic sports and that they have the only interest he has outside of his business relations. What are his business relations? He is a secretary and treasurer of a small manufacturing concern of which I am the chief owner and he is my representative in that affair. He is a member of an athletic club and spends most of his leisure hours with its members. And, I have inquired to learn, they are a very proper set of young men whose chief aim is to bring their physical powers to as near a point of perfection as possible. What is that organization? The Grecian Athletic Club. Nick made a memorandum of this club and turned his attention to the safe in the dining room. A close investigation satisfied him that, by some means, the combination had been found and the safe opened without force. He also found what had not been observed by Mr. Heron, that the draperies in the parlor had been used to wrap up the plate taken from the safe. Well, I told you this morning, said Nick, that I believe skillful and professional burglars had been at work here. A second examination satisfies me that I was right in that statement, and I go further and say that a skillful lockman was at work. Ah, Mr. Heron made this exclamation, but in a tone that suggested to Nick that he did not comprehend its significance. You do not take in all my meaning, said Nick. It means that I can narrow the search for the burglars to a comparatively small circle. There are not so many skilled lockmen among the burglars who are not pretty well known to the authorities. Nothing had been changed in the house since the arrival of Mr. Heron and his wife, and Nick again went over the work done by the burglars in searching the desks, drawers, and other receptacles in the house. Though he made no comment, he was satisfied that while an exhaustive search had been made for some particular thing, it had been made without method or purpose. In other words, the thieves had proceeded to a search without definite information as to the place wherein the thing sought was kept. Evidently, all that was known was that Mr. Heron kept these drawings and models within his dwelling house, and that information might have come from Mr. Heron himself. Nick questioned Mr. Heron on this point, but when the gentleman could not recollect that he had ever told anyone the fact, 
neither could he assert that he had not mentioned it. As a matter of fact, the second examination of the house had not added to the great detective's knowledge, though it had confirmed him in certain beliefs. This house was entered by professional burglars, he said to himself. Whether they entered simply for the purpose of burglary and, finding the case, carried it away with them, or whether they were employed to enter this house to obtain that case and took the plate and jewelry because they could do so easily, are questions which I cannot determine on this showing. He was in Mrs. Heron's room when he said this to himself, and thinking it over, he went to the front window and looked out. On the opposite side of the street, seated on the lower step of a house immediately opposite, was Patsy talking to an ill-favored specimen of a man similarly seated. A single glance assured Nick that Patsy was not idling his time, but was there for a purpose. Whether he was watching for him or not, Nick could not tell, but he drew the curtains aside and placed himself close to the window. Patsy saw him at once and made a series of rapid signals to Nick. They meant to Nick that Patsy had hit upon a man important in their search that he wanted the man followed while he, Patsy, could make a change in his appearance. Telling Mr. Heron that he had no more business in the house and would at once begin the search, Nick descended the stairs and, opening the front door, stood a moment within the vestibule where he signaled to Patsy with his hands that he had understood him. Patsy immediately got up and after a word or two with a fellow beside him, walked off in the direction of the west without looking behind. What did you tell him? That we had found out nothing and suspected nobody. And that was dead right, for we don't yet. Did you find out whom he suspects? Oh no, he's too fly for that. But I'm certain he's laying for the two that he thinks did it. He probably thinks right, said Nick. He makes a starter for you, Patsy. That's what I thought, said Patsy. Anyhow, I'll stick to him and see who he talks to and how he talks. That's right, said Nick. And I'll leave it to you while I go on other lines. Nick went away and Patsy placed himself for a long watch. Spike Thomas stood still at the corner, keeping a sharp eye on all who passed or appeared on any of the four corners. Thank you for watching this video. Please like, share and subscribe to the channel to see the latest videos. Thank you.